everyone. I am Taryn, um, and I'm with KCARD. I think that Katie told you a little bit about us a minute ago, but typically we are sitting down with either the farmer or the ag organization, kind of one-on-one, -on -one, talking through different options. So everything that I'm gonna tell you today is a free service. Sometimes I start talking and people say, okay, yeah, that sounds real expensive. <laughs> How much do you cost? I am very cheap. I am free. So um, this is not going to be a complete list of your options as a farmer's market. It's going to be kind of the most common things that we see here in Kentucky. Um, so and I'm so sorry. Can you all raise your hand one more time if you're involved with the farmer's market? OK, good deal, good deal. Um, all right, so these are kind of the three most common things that we see in Kentucky. Uh, so let's start with a cooperative. Um, is anybody in here, their farmer's market, a cooperative? All right, cool, that's okay. Um, with a cooperative, and I'm not going to go bullet by bullet. I'm going to kind of jump around. I apologize. But with a, with a co-op, it's kind of important to remember that this structure is a for-profit structure. Now, in just a second, I'm going to talk about nonprofit, but for right now, we're talking about co-ops, and they are for-profit. With a for-profit organization, um, there's certain things that have to be in place. Um, so there are certain things like volunteers that get a little iffy. With a for-profit, you have to treat people with labor laws. So volunteers with a co-op. Um, are not going to be as easy to do. Um, but as a co-op, you have members. And those members have um, the right to those profits and those losses. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, so um, often here in Kentucky, we have electric co-ops. And so maybe at the end of the year, you get a check from that co-op with the dividends, kind of that extra money that was left over that they can pay out to their members. A farmer's market can do the same. Um, and also, let's say that your farmer's market is a co-op. You purchase land and you build a farmer's market on it, a structure. Well, let's say that your farmer's market disbands. What do you do with that land? What do you do with that structure? If you are a co-op, you can sell that and then you can uh, divvy out the profits to your members. Now it's going to be different, so hold on to that thought, but that is going to be different than if the same thing were done with a nonprofit. Um, a couple other things, donations to a co-op are not tax deductible because again, it's that for-profit structure. Um, oh, but the biggest thing about a co-op is that there is one member one vote. So a great thing about co-ops is that you get a voice for sure in the decisions. You are a member, you get a vote. Probably, um, and I have no statistics to back this up, so please don't question me on it. So this is anecdotal. I feel the most common way that farmers markets operate in Kentucky are underneath a bigger umbrella. I'm part of my farmer's market in my home county. I'm from Barron County. So we have Bounty of the Barrens Farmer's Market. But Bounty of the Barrens Farmer's Market operates, I'm gonna drop that, operates under Sustainable Glasgow. So Sustainable Glasgow was a 501c3 nonprofit. We'll get to what that means in just a second. And it was formed to promote local music, promote local art, local food, essentially to promote that local economy. So out of that nonprofit, Bounty of the Barrens Farmers Market was born. So you can kind of think of these as there's a larger parent organization, and that parent organization essentially treats that market like a service it provides. So some other common examples of that are extension offices, um, varying degrees of uh, 
commitment to the market through extensions. Sometimes it's that the extension houses the market bank account, but otherwise the market runs itself. Again, varying ways of how that can look, but there's that parent organization. Um, there's a, a few examples of where a local government houses the market. So for example, maybe the city manages the market and it's a line item in their budget, their yearly budget. So it's kind of treated like any other department, public works, parks and recreation, the like. Um, so again, parent organization. This has a lot of pros and cons to it. One thing that can sometimes be a little uh, point of contention is that the market has to abide by the parent organization rules. And sometimes the parent organization has rules that may not completely fit with the farmer's market, right? But because the market is a part of the parent organization, they still have to abide by those rules. Now, just because the financial responsibility, auditing responsibilities and the like fall to that parent organization, it doesn't mean that the farmer's market can just go, eh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> they still have responsibilities to make sure that people are following the rules, financials are being tracked, and that sort of thing. All right, so the next is the nonprofit. How many operate as a nonprofit? Yeah? How many operate under a different umbrella? All right, good deal, good deal. Um, so a nonprofit is very common, and um, this is pretty much the exact opposite of what we talked about for a co-op. A nonprofit is not going to divvy out funds at the end of the year, um, any extra funds. Any extra funds that a nonprofit has has to go back into that organization to further the mission of that organization. Now, it doesn't mean that people can't get paid. <laughs> people can get paid. You can, be, let's say you have a market manager. Um, that market manager can be a volunteer if they would like, um, but you can also pay that market manager. Um, so it does, nonprofit doesn't mean that people can't have a wage. It just means that there's not going to be extra money divvied out, like at the end of the year. No, there's no owner to it. For a nonprofit, the people who govern this are a board of directors. So you do have a smaller group of people making the decisions. So if you have a farmer's market that has 100 vendors, you actually may only have 10 people at the most probably on your board of directors. So those 10 people are making the decisions for all 100 vendors, right? This can look so many different ways. We often suggest that you have a way for vendor voices to be heard. You know, why have a farmer's market board if you don't have farmer's market vendors <laughs> on the board, right? But you can also branch out and have some customers. Maybe you've got customers that are very loyal to the market. Maybe have some of those folks on there. Have someone that is financially minded on that board. So with this, there are some extra people you might want to be involved on the board, but definitely always having a way to have vendor voices heard. Um, probably when I talk about this one, so typically what I do is I sit down with the people who are at the market and we talk about what would be best for them. And when we're talking about nonprofits, inevitably, the question is, I mean, what about this whole 501c stuff? 501c, there's a number after it typically. Um, I think there's like seven to nine numbers that could be after that 501c. Typically, you see 501c3 nonprofits, charitable organizations. Um, that is a federal 
status. You would have to apply to the IRS to get that tax exemption status. So inevitably the question is, that sounds really complicated <laughs> and I, do we have to do that? Um, and the answer is no, you don't have to do that. Um, there are certain things that you do have to do, um, including register with the Secretary of State, um, register with your county, get an EIN number so you can get a bank account, among a couple of other things. Those are all fairly simple tasks that we can hold your hand through. Um, but then the IRS, this 501c tax exemption status, it's just an extra step. Now, we can always sit down with folks, talk to them about why they should or shouldn't do those things, um, but I'm always also going to uh, encourage talking to a CPA um, about that to see if maybe those tax exemptions um, would be worth it for your organization. Um, but another thing to kind of mention here is um, the labor laws are a lot more relaxed, so you can have volunteers here. So for if you have a market manager, we'll just keep going with that explanation. If you have a market manager that says, oh, you know, I just want, I'm a vendor already, and I'll be here to help manage the market, get the tent set up and all that, um, they can be a volunteer if you would like under this type of structure. But no matter the structure, um, you know, when we use the word structure, often we're kind of talking about that legal definition. Do you want to be a nonprofit? Do you want to be a co-op? But structure to me also means that everybody knows the rules. <laughs> no matter the structure that we just talked about, you're still going to need things like bylaws. Bylaws is a document that everyone has sort of looked at, agreed upon, and it's your official rule book for your organization. I will have people call me and say, well, can we do fill in the blank question? And most of the time, it's something that should be in their bylaws. So I will say, well, what does your bylaw say? <laughs> so this is truly your guidebook on how you govern your organization. Now, typically, we suggest bylaws and some other document that is a little more specific. How much are your vendor fees going to be this year? Um, how many um, non-producer vendors are you going to allow? Um, are you going to allow reselling? If so, how much under what circumstances? So these kinds of things are lined out in those types of documents. And I may not look like it, or maybe I do, but I love rules. <laughs> I am a rule follower for the most part. Uh, you can blame my parents on that. They made me and my sister rule followers. Um, so if I know the rule, I know the expectation, and I can meet that expectation. If I don't know the rule, then I'm going to probably push up against some boundaries. You know, a good example is farmers markets may have the rule of we're going to be open every Saturday from 9 to 1. And then inevitably it's like, well, I'm going to come set up at 7. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to start telling all of my customers that I'm going to be here at 7. And that's that's breaking the rule if we understand that the rule is that we open at 9. So you can always go back to the rules and say, hey, remember this thing you signed? That said you would open at 9. I love it when you can blame a piece of paper for something. It's not me. I would totally let you open up at 7 if I could, but I can't because, see, this paper that we all signed says you can't do that. So... Rules, structure, always very important, um, especially financial policies. Who signs checks? Who makes sure at the end of the year that the money is still all there? As honest as we all want to be, I have been in the nonprofit world for a couple of years now. <laughs> uh, 
and almost every nonprofit that I have worked with, not all, but a lot of them, have had some sort of um, fraud. So it's very common, and sometimes it's innocent, sometimes it is not, but financial practices are very important because people want to support farmer's markets, but they don't want to support people who don't have a good reputation. Um, and then, again, no matter the structure, markets should always have a, uh, an outlet to where vendor voices are heard. So for example, I'm gonna go back to uh, my farmer's market. Like I said, they're an umbrella. So we make sure that we have a farmer's market committee that is 100% the vendors of that market. And we have a few people that are on the market committee and market vendors that are on our board. So that way we make sure that we are, even though we have other things that we're doing, we're making sure that we always hear those market voices. I truly believe in this quote. I first heard it from my friend, Brett Wolf at Center for Crop Diversification. A rising tide lifts all boats. I tried to find who originally said this. There's apparently some debate on who coined this term. Uh, I always thought it was John F. Kennedy. It may not have been, <laughs> so, uh, but we will just leave it blank and say it may have been him. Um, but I truly feel this way about farmers markets. I truly feel like if we are all there together, we're banding together to market our products, we can lift all of our boats. That's the great thing about farmers markets. But if farmers markets are in chaos, that's very hard to do because customers don't care about farmers markets structure. They don't care if you're a co-op. They don't care if you're a nonprofit. They want to know when you're gonna be open and what you're gonna have. They want you to be consistent and transparent. So when we have a structure that works for the group, it makes a rising tide lift all boats a lot easier. I'm gonna point out uh, a partner organization. There are others that are here today that I'm not gonna mention because that you will be hearing them, but I'm gonna have Sandra wave real quick. Hey, Sandra. <laughs> uh, Sandra's with CFA, Community Farm Alliance, and CFA does so much work for farmers markets. Um, one of the programs that we are involved with with CFA is the Farmers Market Resiliency Program. So this is where farmers markets um, reach out to CFA and you're put into a cohort of other farmers markets. And we do education series for somewhere around six to nine months. We do meetups, we do Zoom education, we meet in person, um, you know, a variety of, of ways, but it's all education. It's education on how to write bylaws, on um, how to track financials, how to do fundraisers, um, and it is so great because not only do you get to meet service providers and have a better relationship with them, you meet other farmers markets across the state. And sometimes, I can say from experience, sometimes it can feel a little isolated when you're just worried about your farmers market. So when you hear that a farmers market 20 counties away from you is also having similar issues and you all can talk very honestly about how you're each dealing with those, it is incredibly helpful. Um, so I love that program, I love being involved with it with CFA, such a great partner. They also have um, various programs, Fresh RX, uh, Sandra can definitely talk to you about that one. Um, it is a program that helps um, get fruits and vegetables to pregnant, peop pregnant people, sorry. Um, and then the Kentucky Double Dollars program, where your market can potentially double the money of people on WIC and SNAP benefits. Um, the other thing I'll mention on this is that they have a farmer's market toolkit. Um, it also lists out more of the structures than I mentioned today. Some farmer's markets are LLCs, so uh, there's other options out there to look at. All right, that little QR code I hope works for you. Uh, I am still new to the QR code world. Uh, I'm what they call an elder millennial, which I feel is rude, but um, 
I like technology, but I don't always understand it. Uh, so this QR code gives you to our newsletter sign up. Um, and if you would like a follow up from KCARD to talk about either your individual farmer's market, your business, um, your farm, um, what have you. It also allows you to sign up for our newsletters. Um, we have a couple of those, including one called Funding Matters, which um, talks about the grant opportunities that are out there. Um, that is my information. I am happy to come and talk to your farmer's market about what is best for you. You may already have a structure, but you may want to uh, talk about ways to make it more efficient, other options for you. I would be happy to do that.